So, kind of crazy, it's almost been four months now since I've done one of these videos, so I guess it's about time I welcome you all to Collector's Diary 2014 Edition. If you've never seen one of these videos before, I have taken every purchase, every sale I have made for the past 10 years of collecting and recorded it inside of a spreadsheet. In this video, we are going to go through the year of 2014 and look at everything I bought, everything I sold, and everything I kept for my personal collection. In 2014, I would be third year university now and still working as a janitor, making about about 17, 18 Canadian per hour. The vast majority of my money at this time is going towards tuition and textbooks, of course, but through constant buying and selling, basically like a second job, I was always able to keep collecting. So let's pop over to the spreadsheet and we can see what the world of buying and selling video games was like back in 2014. All right, so if you've never seen one of these videos before, this leftmost column are the items I purchased. In the little brackets here, I put that it's new in box and for PS2. This column right here is the price I paid for the items this column right here is the price I sold them for. This is if I went positive or negative on the deal. And over here in the far column, it does show everything that I did keep. All of the prices shown are in Canadian. So if you want to convert them over to US dollars, just take roughly 20% off of the price. So with that out of the way, let's get into 2014 here. Let's see what I was up to. And just looking at this already, it looks like it's going to be a lot quieter of a year compared to what 2013 was. So first purchase of the year, Dragon Ball Z Trilogy factory sealed for PS2. This is that cardboard box version that does include three games inside. 2014, I was deep into completing my Dragon Ball Z set. I'm trying to get every North American Dragon Ball Z game in VGA 85 plus condition. Well, not every single North American game. I did kind of stop at PS3, Xbox 360, but every game prior to those, which of course down here as well, you can see I bought my first copy of Dragon Ball Z Legacy of Goku 2 for $39. And I say my first one because I know that I bought more in 2014 and we're going to see that in just a second here. And kind of funny, this right here is a Donkey Kong arcade classic series, which is the black box Donkey Kong. And you can see I paid $49 for it and I didn't even write down the variation of it. I don't know if it was a hang tab print, gloss sticker, I do not know. Back in 2014, I didn't know variants nearly as well as I do now, obviously nor were they as emphasized. So just kind of funny to point out there. And you can see here in January, right? Super quiet month. I only spent 150 total and I brought most of it back. Only kept a few things for the personal collection over here. Moving into the next month though, you can see I bought a VGA 85 plus Mario Brothers for the Atari 2600 for $381, which is actually pretty crazy. That's pretty expensive for an 85 plus Mario Brothers on Atari 2600. I remember I bought this purely to resell. So I picked it up probably off of eBay and then I took it over to Nintendo Age and I was like, hey, what do you guys think this is worth type of thing? And most people on Nintendo Age weren't really interested in this since it was Atari. The Atari Mario game really didn't have that many fans or collectability at the time. The only reason this was selling, or the only reason I even bought it at such a premium, is because it was 85 plus graded and graded games did still carry heavy premiums. So some people on Nintendo Age suggested I go over to Atari Age and see if anyone would be interested there. And <laughs> the short answer was no. Absolutely no one was interested on Atari Age. Now, I wasn't an Atari Age member prior to making my my account to go and ask about this game. So, I mean, take that for what it is. But as soon as I went over there, made my account and made a thread about it, and I was like, hey, is anyone interested in this Mario Bros? Here's the price. What price might it be worth type of thing? I got absolutely shit on. All of the Atari guys were saying how common it is. You're an idiot for paying what you did. Keep your VGA graded crap away from here. So after Nintendo Age didn't want it and Atari Age shit all over me for it, I did take it back to eBay where I did eventually sell it here, as you can see, for 431, which netted me a profit of 50 bucks. So a lot of work, a lot of getting made fun of, and barely any return for my efforts on an Atari 2600 Mario Bros, but it did teach me a lot about Atari and the way that Atari collectors view the market. You can actually see underneath that I bought a raw 2600 Mario Bros for only 34 Canadian and then resold it and made 19 bucks. I'm sure that I sold it because it wasn't in good enough condition to grade, but you can easily, easily see there how much of a premium the 85 plus was bringing even on a game like this. So yeah, that's kind of my first experience with Atari collecting and factory sealed Atari. This here is just stupid to see. I bought a Chrono Trigger guidebook for 46 bucks back in 2014. And here is that very guidebook. I have had it for sale locally for the past seven years and no one has bought it. I've slowly raised the price on it as the years have passed and I've always been below eBay by quite a bit. Um, yeah, hopefully someday I'll sell it and I'll turn a nice 20 to $40 profit on it.
And you can see in February, largely thanks to the Mario Bros there, I did spend 500. I almost brought back 500. So only spent $13 total. I have this really nice guidebook to show for it. And I did keep a copy of Dragon Ball Z Budokai factory sealed for PS2. Which brings us to March where I only had two transactions total, but they're actually both pretty good ones. So the first one here, I was able to get a complete in box Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver for only 40 Canadian total. And you can see here that I did keep the entire cardboard boxes plus Pokewalkers. And all I actually sold was the small case plus the game. So I made 43 three dollars off it and kept everything that actually matters and right underneath it i was able to get dragon ball z tenkaichi 3 for ps2 which did eventually grade into vga 85 plus if you don't know tenkaichi 3 is one of the best dragon ball z games ever made paying the 57 back in 2014 it was going for about 100 at the time so i did get a deal on it even then and this is one where i was really worried about buying a factory sealed one i wouldn't be able to get the gold condition on it but i got really lucky on this whole thing and i still have this budokai tenkaichi three in my collection and you can see in march just nothing happening 97 spent made 50 bucks but did add some really really nice things to the collection which brings us to april and the next time that i bought dragon ball z legacy of goku 2 i bought an opened factory case pack and my plan with this case pack was purely again for the personal collection so when i got all of the games i took out the two nicest ones and sent them in for grading the rest i just sold off i did get a 90 plus and a 95 on on those two copies which that was huge getting the 95 was exactly what i wanted out of this so you can see that i just sold off the other five copies made 46 dollars total and ended up keeping my vga 95 for free. So the big thing is that when I was in university and not making that much money, I had way more time than I did money. So a lot of the transactions I did are things where I could bring in a lot of stuff and then take time to resell the stuff. But then in the long run, I would end up keeping free stuff or making small amounts of money while still being able to collect. So if you're in a spot where you don't have a lot of money, try to use your time the best you can, be it going to thrift shops, grad sales, or buying lots and reselling, because there is a lot of value in using your time time to build your collection. And here is what a Mega Man X3 manual cost back in 2014. Mega Man X3 was always expensive. It's just always been one of the most expensive Super Nintendo games. Even way back in 2014, a manual was hundred bucks. So in four months of collecting so far in 2014, I've only actually spent out of pocket about 30 bucks, which really was a lot of the goal. I wanted to collect as much as I could for as little as I could. So even if I'm not adding a ton of stuff to the collection, I'm also not spending a lot of money and that's key. Coming into May 2014, you can see I bought a factory sealed bundle here. Tales of Symphonia GameCube, Fire Emblem GameCube, and Dot Hack GU Volume 3 Redemption for $360 total. And what I actually wanted out of this bundle, surprisingly, was the Dot Hack GU Volume 3. I was collecting the Dot Hack games at the time. And what's crazy is I sold factory sealed Fire Emblem and Tales of Symphonia, and I only got $185 back, which is like 150 US, give or take, for both of those games. And the Dot Hack actually ended up costing me quite a bit of money there. I don't even know if the game's worth that much today. I'm just doing a price check on the game right now, and it looks like you can buy a copy now in 2021 for like half of what I paid for it back in 2014. And that just shows that collector interest does greatly change over the years. So if you're chasing after current PS4, PS5, Nintendo Switch games, just keep in mind that in five years, the interest or what's rare or collectible very well might change. Got absolutely slaughtered on that dot hack game. It did grade into a VGA 90 though. So I mean, hey, that was cool. For the Game Boy Advance collectors out there, Space Channel 5, Ulala's Cosmic Attack, Factory Sealed, 84, dollars and this is probably why i was spending so little in 2014 is because i was saving up to send games off to get graded you can see here that i sent games off to be graded and it was 1380 dollars so i probably sent off like 20 games or so i wish i had it written down what games exactly i sent off but this would be the second time I sent off games to be graded. Thanks to grading games in May, all of a sudden I'm out 1500 bucks. So thank God I wasn't spending money the months prior. Ah, ha, ha. here is the other reason why I probably wasn't spending much money. 
June 2014, Mark's Collection. I already told the full story of this on my YouTube, so if you like these kind of collector reseller stories, make sure to go check that out afterwards. But $4,000 spent right here on Mark's Collection in June. And these resale numbers here on Mark's Collection, where I brought back $4,200, were months, if not years later. As you guys know, this was a massive collection purchase, and it took a lot of time and work to do successfully. But what an incredible purchase, and I would do it the exact same way again if I had the opportunity. For you Game Boy Advance fans again, Dragon Ball Z, Booze Fury, and GT Transformation 2-in-1 game, $64 for that, factory sealed. This is another one of the really hard Dragon Ball Z games to get factory sealed. And you can see in June, I did spend $4,200, but at this point, I do have a loan taken out. So I wonder if July is going to get a little bit bigger in spending. So entering into July, I was finally able to upgrade my smoke damage Jack Bros. So if you don't know anything about Virtual Boy, Jack Bros is released by Atlas and is by far the rarest North American Virtual Boy game. The North American Virtual Boy library is like 13 or 14 games total, so I mean, it's not really saying much, but Jack Bros is truly a hard to find rare game. Here's the last completed listing for a CIB I can find on eBay right now. 1700 bucks US. So I bought my copy for $200, which is a much better price. And even at the time, this was a little bit of a deal to only pay 200, because you can see I was able to sell my smoke damaged one for 214. So a real nice one probably was in the 300, 350 range. So I was able to get a deal on it, upgrade my copy, sell my old copy, and basically break even, which Again, that is the perfect thing to do when doing this. International Superstar Soccer 2000, complete in box on Nintendo 64. Again, a game that was just always expensive, 150 bucks here. All I wanted to get was the stupid registration card out of it. So I bought a complete in box, sold everything else and kept a registration card for 18 bucks. Just a pain in the ass game to try and get fully complete. And right here, we have a heavy, heavy purchase in 2014. Factory sealed Battletoads for NES, which did eventually grade VGA 85. I paid $342 for it. And this wasn't an eBay bin snipe or anything like that. This was just some guy on Nintendo Age put this up for sale and I messaged him. We worked out a price and I was able to purchase it. This was just right around the going rate for this game at the time, which is pretty crazy. Honestly, I'm not sure if the PAL version of this game had already flooded the market at that time. Honestly, not 100% sure, but I'm super glad that I was able to hold on to this battle toads through the years. In 2021, it is now a grail piece in my collection. Again, it's just crazy what time can do to your perception of certain items. So thanks to a few heavier purchases, I did actually spend 1100 in July, which getting up there, not bad month, not a bad month. Out of pocket, 418 bucks, which doesn't feel like much, but it was at the time. Moving into August, we can see that a complete in box Mario RPG was $173 still. That just seems crazy that it was still that expensive back then. I also bought and sold another Pokemon Heart Gold. These were super good for reselling for a long time. Xenoblade Chronicles complete in box. $46 sold for $55. I bought it, played it, and resold it. Which is a huge thing too. If you are primarily a gamer and you just want to buy some of these modern games right at release, pay your $60, $70 bucks when it comes out, and then just play the game and sell it immediately for $40, $50. Even for retro games, this is just something to keep in mind. If you ever want to play a game on its original console, Buy it, play it, and just sell it again. It will cost you way, way less if you don't care about collecting it. Nothing too, too interesting in the month of August. 567 spent, brought back 772, and I need to update this to be green. Much better. There we go. $204 profit in August. In September here, barely any purchases at all, but they're both pretty big ones. So the first one here, Tiny Toons, Buster's Scary Dream for Game Boy Advance. Two of them factory sealed. Cost me $450. I did grade both of them and they both came back as VGA 85 plus. So you can see here, I did sell one of the 85 plus copies of this game and I did end up keeping one for $95. If you're not at all familiar with Buster's Scary Dream, it is one of the harder to find Game Boy Advance games, especially factory sealed. I remember back then there was talk that this was an unreleased game, that there was very small quantity that leaked into the market. I don't know if any of that is valid or true, but the game is always had really high collector demand and it didn't really exist. At least it had a lot of demand in 2014. So it looks like these days the game is still pretty expensive if you want to buy one, but there is also just a factory sealed version sitting here on eBay. So it looks like it's not a game that people are climbing over themselves to purchase anymore. So again, like I said, the games that are held in the highest regard or seen as grails, 
do change over the years as more information comes out or more of them are found or whatever changes in the public perception of all the collectors. And right underneath it we have DuckTales 2 and Rescue Rangers 2, both almost complete in box. Rescue Rangers 2 did not have a manual and you can see that I just sold off the Rescue Rangers 2 cart and box for 180 and just ended up keeping DuckTales 2 for 195 bucks, which is huge. Knocking off any of those high tier NES games is always a great feeling. Moving into October you can see I got another two Dragon Ball Z games for the collection as well as purchasing a fully complete Majora's Mask for N64 only because I wanted this correction notice pamphlet. I'll try to find a picture of it and put it on screen. I'm pretty sure it makes notice that the game is not multiplayer because either the back of the box or the manual, somewhere it was mentioned that the game was multiplayer and this little correction pamphlet says, nope, the game's only one player. And somehow, some way, I was able to get a great deal on a complete box snatcher for Sega CD. Bought for 150, sold for 283. 133 bucks profit. Very quiet October, but added a few games to the collection and made $77. Moving into November, I was able to add a complete in box Snow Brothers to the collection. This is when I was still pretty heavy into doing a complete in box NES set, so I was trying to knock off some of these higher NES games. In 2021, I have started selling off my NES set. I'm no longer trying to do a complete set of it, so it was nice while it lasted. It was fun while I was doing it, but it's just not something now that I could ever imagine completing. But what is incredible here is that this is the month where I got my World of Nintendo Fiber Optic sign. So you can only kind of see it behind me there as I sit here. That is a massive World of Nintendo fiber optic sign that they used in retail displays. Crazy enough, someone had it locally in my little city and when it came up for sale, I was like, yeah, no, I, I have to pay whatever this guy wants in order to get it. So you can see that I paid $400 cash, but I'm pretty sure I also traded a Rescue Rangers 2 cartridge on top of it, which was somewhere in the $100, $150 range. So about $500, $550 to get this sign, which I think at the time was a decent deal on it. They were hardly ever bought and sold, so like I said, I was just willing to pay whatever price it took to own it. There really are certain items in collecting where if you do not purchase it the time it comes up, the odds of you ever having another opportunity to buy it are extremely slim. This sign for me really fit that category. Seeing this on here and going back down memory lane of acquiring the item just brought back a whole bunch of nostalgia. If you're wondering what a Nintendo 64 bundle might have cost you back in 2014, here is a bundle with two controllers, Mario Party, 007 GoldenEye, Donkey Kong 64, and Super Mario 64 that I bought for 90 bucks and sold for 130. They still weren't super cheap, but it was obviously much cheaper than what we pay today. So in November, largely thanks to Snow Brothers and the World of Nintendo sign, I did bleed a little bit, but uh, again, right, no real complaints. Which brings us to December 2014, where I got my first copy of Donkey Kong Jr. Math. This was a newly listed eBay Buy It Now, and I sniped it immediately. If you don't know, the box for Donkey Kong Jr. Math was historically the hardest black box box to find by a long shot. These days it's still extremely difficult, but games like Matt Sticker Mario have taken over in price. So at the time I bought this for $123, it was probably closer to five, six hundred dollars actual retail. Here's the most recent one I can find for Donkey Kong Jr. Math, $1,100, and you can see that that gets you an absolutely thrashed box. So Donkey Kong Jr. Math, still very expensive. And once again for the Game Boy Advance collectors, Jet Grind Radio and Mario Pinball Land. 81 total for the two games. Jet Grind Radio did grade into VGA 85 plus. And that brings us to the end of 2014. You can see in the totals here, I spent $12,000. I brought back about 9,300, and overall in 2014, I spent $2,712.25 which at the time was a decent amount of money to spend on video game collecting in the course of the year. Now, seven years later, $2,700 for even a few of the items I just talked about is incredible. If you're newer to buying and selling, newer to collecting, the number one thing I can recommend you do is make yourself a spreadsheet, write down every single purchase you make, every single sale you make. Not only is it incredible to have all these memories written down, but it also greatly helps you track your finances where you can just look back and be like, oh God, in December I spent this much money, I, I really need to sell some things or this means next month I really can't spend much. You just get way better at budgeting and you get way more money conscious. Of course, that's just my opinion. Do whatever the hell you want with your own collecting. If you enjoy this type of content, I have done 2013 and 2012 as well. And if you want to hear more about the biggest collection I ever purchased, which actually was three years in the making, click on this video right here. I'll see you guys next time.